Is the new Bill and Ted movie truly excellent or bogus? Turns out it's a little of both. Here are the five best and five worst things in Bill and Ted Face the Music. Bill and Ted Face the Music opens with a wedding, as Bill and Ted's ex-stepmom Missy is now marrying Ted's little brother, Deacon. After delivering a strange yet heartfelt wedding speech, Bill and Ted honor the happy couple by providing the music for their first dance. The world premiere of the first three movements of That Which Binds Us Through Time, the chemical, physical, and biological nature of love. An exploration of the meaning of meaning, part one. One, two, three, four. What follows is a bizarrely hilarious mishmash of throat singing, bagpipes, trumpet, and who knows what else. As Missy and Deacon try in vain to dance to the strange noises Bill and Ted are producing, it's clear just how desperate Bill and Ted have become to try to compose the song that Rufus told them they were destined to write. Between the song and their speech, it's a perfect reintroduction to Bill and Ted, showing that they're still the same lovable doofuses from the first two movies while also acknowledging how the intervening 25 years have weighed on them. While we're glad that Bill and Ted's wives, princesses Joanna and Elizabeth, get a little more to do in Face the Music than in the previous two films, their subplot winds up being one of the film's weaker links. Early on, their much older selves arrive in a time machine of their own to take their younger counterparts to find a reality where they're happy with Bill and Ted. But ultimately, the princesses realize the happiest in the present with their husbands, which begs the question of why the elderly princesses felt the need to intervene in their lives in the first place. Even if the future princesses actually traveled back in time to save their marriages, that doesn't make sense when we learn the real reason why Joanna and Elizabeth have requested marriage counseling. It's not, as is first implied, because they are frustrated by their husband's codependence. It's actually because they're worried about their emotional well-being after 25 years of trying to write a world-saving song and coming up empty. So it seems like their marriages weren't even in trouble to begin with, and the idea of leaving their husbands only ever occurred to them when their future selves showed up. What was the point of it all? We may never know. At the end of Bill and Ted's bogus journey, we were introduced to babies Little Bill and Little Ted. In Face the Music, we learn that those babies are actually Bill and Ted's daughters, Theodora Preston and Billy S. Logan, and that they've grown up to be their dad's biggest fans. After seeing their dads disappear into the future, Billy and Thea embark on an excellent adventure of their own, trying to assemble the greatest band the world has ever seen to help their dads perform their song. I feel so bad for him. They've been doing this on their own for the longest time. Yeah, I wish there was some way we could help them out, you know? Yeah. But Billy and Thea's greatest contribution to Bill and Ted Face the Music are actresses Bridget Lundy Payne and Samara Weaving themselves, who recall the same exuberant energy that Keanu Reeves and Alex Winter brought to the original film. Yet Billy and Thea aren't carbon copies of their dads either, as evidenced by their more thoughtful approach to problem solving and surprisingly advanced understanding of temporal dynamics. They're a delightful addition to the world of Bill and Ted, and we wouldn't say no to seeing Billy and Thea's excellent adventure at some point down the timeline. From excellent adventure to face the music, Bill and Ted have always managed to remain the same big-hearted, well-intentioned, music-loving bozos that we first met as teenagers. Yet in Bill and Ted face the music, when Bill and Ted decide to head to the future to see if they can get their world-uniting song from their future selves, nearly every version of themselves that they meet is a total jerk. They start out by traveling to 2022, where they meet themselves as bitter, washed-up has-beens who have been left by their wives and are living in a van. Their next stop is 2025, where they find themselves squatting at Dave Grohl's mansion in an attempt to pass one of the Foo Fighters' frontman songs off as their own. The 2025 Bill and Ted even wind up attempting to kill their past selves, even though that would lead to their own destruction. Then they head to 2030, where they're in prison and are determined to swap places with their 2020 counterparts. Not only does it not make sense that none of these Bill or Ted's would have any memory of their universe-aligning concert in 2020, but their characterization is light years from the previously consistent twosome we've come to know and love. While most of the members of Bill and Ted's band that perform at the end of the film were carefully curated by their daughters, Kid Cudi is a gift from the universe itself. At the beginning of Bill and Ted Face the Music, we learn that the very fabric of space and time is unraveling, with people disappearing from their own times and getting transported into totally different times and places. That's how Kid Cudi winds up dropping onto Bill and Ted's cody sack in San Dimas. Writers Steer and Billy have returned home with their newly assembled band. But while Kid Cudi is a fun addition to the band, he brings a lot more than 
and his rapping and music production skills to the table. It turns out that this version of Kid Cudi is obsessed with quantum physics, and as soon as Billy and Thea explain to him what's happening with the universe, he instantly grasps what's going on. For the rest of the film, Kid Cudi serves as a group's resident time travel expert, whom they consult whenever they have a particularly tricky quantum conundrum. It's fun to have a member of the group who talks about time travel in a more academic way than we're used to from Bill and Ted films, even if other characters rarely understand him. The great leader has a very different view of history than her late husband Rufus, and rather than attempting to help Bill and Ted, she constructs an assassin robot to kill them. Given the name Dennis Caleb McCoy, the robot skips around the timeline, determined to exterminate his targets. Eventually, he succeeds, killing himself in the process, and winds up sending all three of them to hell to negotiate with death. From then on, Dennis is just a strange tag-along who acts more like a lost child than a killer robot. Overall, his inclusion seems intended to add laughs, but instead it winds up dragging the film down, with Dennis failing to live up to the high energy and zany comedy of the other characters. Even his dancing at the end feels a little dull and disconnected, which is unfortunate when everything else about the final concert comes together so well. After spending most of the three movies under the impression that the fate of the world rests entirely on their shoulders, Bill and Ted realize in the climax of Face the Music that it's their daughters, not them, who have the potential to save the universe. It still fits with what Rufus told them in the first movie, when he explained why he had to ensure Bill and Ted weren't separated. You see, eventually, your music will help put an end to war and poverty. It will align the planets and bring them into universal harmony. It turns out that Bill and Ted needed to stay together so that Billy and Thea could grow up side by side, listening to music and hearing their dad's stories of traveling through time. Does it make complete sense with what we've previously been told? Well, no, but that's par for the course for a Bill and Ted movie. Besides, the reason it works isn't because it's an intrinsically conceived plot twist, but because it shows the growth of Bill and Ted's characters. They began the franchise desiring greatness for themselves, but they end it by showing that they're willing to step away from the spotlight without a second thought, handing it over to their kids for the greater good. When you think about it, the great leader's plan is a little ridiculous. She tells her daughter, Kelly, that she believes that the deaths of Bill and Ted will usher in the events that lead to their utopian future and repair the universe, not their song performance. But that doesn't jive at all with what we were told in the first film, or even with the world-building of the third film. The great leader knows the precise date and time of the concert which will repair the universe and lead to their society. Yet somehow, reasons that preventing the concert by killing Bill and Ted is the better option. There's no evidence that seems to support her belief, and by trying to prevent events that already happened earlier in her own timeline, she seems to be risking catastrophe. Maybe if the future was a disaster, it would make sense that she would try to prevent it, but as it stands, it doesn't make sense that she'd try to stop the events that create her own utopia. The truth is, Bill and Ted's excellent adventure sets up an impossible premise for Face the Music to deliver on. It works in the first film to say that sometime in the future, Bill and Ted will write a song that brings about universal peace and harmony. But that premise breaks down when you have to show that song in the third film. Music is subjective, which means that there's no song anyone could write that all audiences would buy as a song that would save the world. Yet, the entire plot of Face the Music relies on Bill and Ted performing such a song by the end of the film. The solution to this problem turns out to be surprisingly simple and elegant. It's not about the song itself, but about humanity uniting across time and space to create music together. One of the main themes of the Bill & Ted trilogy has always been about friends and strangers working together to accomplish great things. So even if the song isn't entirely your jam, there's no need to suspend disbelief, because as Thea and Billy explain at the end of the film, it wasn't so much the song that made the difference, it was everyone playing it together. Bill and Ted movies have always marched to the beat of their own drum in the logic department, but the reasoning of face and music seems a little nonsensical even by Bill and Ted's standards. First, there's the question of how none of the future Bill and Ted's seem to have any knowledge of the 2020 concert until the Bill and Ted from 2067, yet they all remember going on the same time-traveling journey that we see play out in the film as evidenced by the 2025 Bill and Ted being able to hatch an elaborate plan to try to deceive their past selves. There's also the issue of why Rufus seemed to know exactly how and when Bill and Ted would save the world, but then no one else in the future did. The great leaders seemed to have no knowledge of how the concert came about, who performed it, or what the song sounded like. All she had was Rufus's information, even though she had technology that puts all of time and space right at her fingertips. Plus, how do any of these futures even exist if all of reality collapsed in on itself in 2020? 
All of it adds up to a time travel plot that mirrors the wackiness of the first film, but lacks the internal cohesion. If Face and Music wanted to play around with a bunch of alternate realities, that could have been cool, but it doesn't really work when the plot is focused on maintaining a reality that already exists. Check out one of our newest videos right here! Plus, even more Looper videos about your favorite movies and TV shows are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.